What's going on guys? Killer6 back with another Borderlands 3 Top 10 and this time we're taking a look at 10 things that I think Borderlands 3 did right and 10 things that I think that it did wrong. So be advised there may be some spoilers ahead. Let's kick things off with the 10 things that I think that they did right followed immediately by the 10 things I think they did wrong. There are chapter breaks available if you'd like to skip ahead to the other stuff. Number 10. At number 10, faster farming than ever before in a Borderlands game. Sorry, old gen console players. I know this is still a sore spot for you guys. And I started out on my Borderlands career playing Borderlands 2 on Xbox 360. So I do feel your pain. But load times aside, the actual farming process in Borderlands 3 is much smoother than ever before. Most enemies you want to farm have a nearby save station or a fast travel station, meaning you can just save and quit and be near enough that you don't need to drive across the map to farm their loot. And once you get that loot, you don't have to run back across the map to travel back to Sanctuary thanks to being able to fast travel from anywhere. Loot pools are a bit crowded, but most of that has been offset by giving most enemies a 30% chance to drop one of the three items from their loot pool, making it essentially a 10% chance at the item you want, which is very comparable to most of the drops in Borderlands 2. Also, unlike Borderlands 2, you no longer need to farm perfect parts in order to be able to use an item. Some will say that farming parts is replaced by farming annoyments, but those can be re-rolled now in exchange for Iridium at Crazy Earl's re-roll machine. I do feel that the reroll cost is too expensive at 250 iridium per reroll, and likely that should be lowered to 50 iridium per reroll. But still, having that option is almost akin to being able to change the stock or barrel of a weapon in Borderlands 2 to make it better. Number nine. At number nine, audio and visual improvements. From the general game audio to the cartel soundtrack, the audio work in Borderlands 3 is absolutely amazing. Probably the best in franchise history. Guns have a uniqueness to them in audio now. Enemies have unique and often hilarious death dialogue. Vehicles all sound different from one another. Action skills all have audio cues that give added weight and emphasis. I love everything about the audio design of this game. Visually, having an evolution of the graphics is always a little bit scary. You're slightly changing how each character looks but I personally love the change. After all, how else would we know that Tannis is packing so much ham in those pants and uh, so is Vaughn. Vocal performances are exceptional as well. Whether you love her or hate her, I feel that Tyreen delivered some powerful voice work. There's especially some good stuff between her and her father. I absolutely love Wainwright. It's one of my favorite vocal performances along with Clay. However, Jeremy Lee as Gage in DLC 2 absolutely steals the show in a lot of ways. From evolving her character from a teenager to a young adult, and then having Gage do the impressions of Clay, Brick, and the other characters. Her work here is some of my favorite in the entire franchise, and I kind of geeked out the first time I played through that DLC, and I heard her doing her impressions of all the other characters. It was so perfectly done. My only complaint about visuals is in regard to the visual pollution, but more on that in the second half of this video. Number eight. Coming in at number eight, new characters, Balex, Clay, Wainwright, Lorelai, and some of my favorite villains in the franchise in Private Beans and the Tron family. I also love the interactions between Reese and Katagawa, who probably could have been the main villain if they had angled for it. Typhon de Leon is another really interesting character, the first Vault Hunter and father of the Calypso twins. I even like Troy and Tyreen at face value, but not so much as the main villains. It's hard to argue that their concept alone isn't very cool. And then there's Nereid, the unseen siren who locked herself away in the vault where Typhon and his wife Leda conceived the twins. The Nereid writings give us some of the best siren lore in the series, shedding light on how sirens came to be and even how they choose their successor in death. Death. Sliding in at number seven is the takedowns. The Malawan takedown is beloved by pretty much everybody who's ever done it. And the Guardian takedown is not so much. There's things that I absolutely love about the Guardian takedown. However, Ananthema and Scourge are fun fights and not just bullet sponges. They actually feel like raid bosses that they are. The Valkyries and Wotan are both fun fights as well, if not a little bit easier than traditional raids. But still, the long form style of the takedowns is a nice new approach for Borderlands. Had the Guardian takedown been a little less long or had more checkpoints or even ways to respawn teammates between sections like arms race does then it could have been amazing regardless i'd love to see takedowns return in future installments leaning more toward the malawan takedown side of things that said traditional raids are always going to be much beloved in borderlands and i feel like we need more of those too number six at number six is balancing. Borderlands has always been the type of game that is somewhat complicated to balance in a way that appeases the majority of players. Borderlands 2 had an amazing balance on normal and true Vault Hunter modes, but then fell apart completely with ultimate mode and forcing dependence on slag and limiting the number of useful guns and shields. Borderlands 3 took a different approach and is far better balanced in game because of that. However, the in-game balancing has possibly made normal mode in levels one through 30 a little bit easy-ish than in previous installments, but I'd argue that that's not such a big deal since that 
that's just story mode and most people try to rush through that as fast as possible anyhow ultimately if you look at every borderlands game to date it's hard to argue that borderlands 3 doesn't give you the most variety in gear and builds from any other game and number five is the DLC writing. Much has been made about the base game story for Borderlands 3, but rarely do you hear the praise that the DLC writing deserves. DLC 1 brought back Timothy, the handsome Jack Doppelganger, which potentially paves the way for some interesting future narrative. DLC 2 was an award-nominated story that took us to a frozen planet to celebrate the marriage of Wainwright and Hammerlock, and it features one of the most powerful side quests in Borderlands history. DLC 3 is my absolute favorite DLC in Borderlands 3, giving us cowboys and samurais kind of vibe. I love the narrative. I love the atmosphere, the music, and the classic story of a stranger riding into town to help the locals fight off the bad guys. Classic Western stuff. DLC 4 is arguably the most powerful story-wise, dealing with loss, grief, and mental health. Krieg losing Maya and how he deals with it is very emotional. And then finally, you have the Director's Cut DLC, which gave us the Ava Murder Mysteries, which, lover or hater, you have to admit the Ava Murder Mysteries gave us some pretty interesting lore for the future of the franchise. I won't spoil it here, but you should check it out. Number 4. At number four, the most diverse legendary items to date. From guns that shoot pentagrams to guns that shoot out skulls that do massive splash damage, shields that make the B shield look weak, to shields that launch melee damage at nearby enemies. Class mods that keep your action skill going non-stop, artifacts that steal ammo from across the map, right down to grenades that send a barrage of skulls at enemies. Borderlands 3 has the most diverse selection of legendary loot from any Borderlands game to date, period. Some of my favorite gear includes the Hellwalker, the Soul Render, Backburner, Tizzy, Plasma Coil, Free Radical, Multi-Tap, DNA, Chaos, and Blood Star Beast, Breath of the Dying, Torrent, One Pump Jump, Face Puncher, Convergence, Reflux, Proprietary License, Redistributor, Clairvoyance, Rowan's Call, Lucky 7, Unseen Threat, Gas Call, Hex, It's Piz, Nagata, Fish Slab, Victory Rush, Schluter, Company Man, Pearl of Ineffable Knowledge, Void Drift, Transformer, Stinger, Revolter, Old God, Infernal Wish, Super Soldier, Stopgap, Frozen Heart, and so many more. It's not even up for discussion. This is the Borderlands game that gave us the most diverse and useful at Endgame collection of legendary gear. Number three. Which leads us to number three, build variety. In previous Borderlands games, there was a very clear meta. Be in Sandhawk, Unkempt Herald, Grog Nozzle, Norfleet, generally one or two viable in-game builds for each character. However, in Borderlands 3, there's a near limitless number of gear and build combos. Each Vault Hunter has multiple viable in-game builds, and many can swap those builds on the fly. Like Flak switching from Gamma Burst to Fade Away to do something different in battle. It's not uncommon to see builds in Borderlands 3 centered solely around one type of weapon. I've done snipers only, shotguns only, even just specific manufacturer only playthroughs, and every time it is fun and capable of doing the in-game content. The counter to this is that maybe in-game is a bit too easy compared to previous Borderlands games, especially Borderlands 2, and that's fair. Borderlands 2 and Ultimate and OP levels was very punishing and restrictive for builds. Personally, I like it a little more casual, but I would love to see Gearbox maybe add in a bit of a higher mayhem level that only increases the challenge for those that want it as well. Number two. At number two, free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. Those of you who've played Borderlands since the launch of Borderlands 2, like me, probably remember having to pay for basically everything. Headhunters, level cap increases, ultimate mode, OP levels, additional DLC outside of the season pass, additional vault hunters, etc. But I never minded. I always felt like I got my money's worth from Borderlands. Well, Borderlands 3 took it a step further and made damn near everything free. Level cap increases, even if I feel like they weren't implemented well, and more on that later. Seasonal content, which were basically like headhunters, takedowns, cosmetics, and much more more, which is why it absolutely blew my mind when people complained about a second season pass. More content for the game I love, and it wasn't that expensive, that was an easy decision for me. We were given so much free stuff that I think a lot of people forgot that making content does cost money, time, and manpower, and maybe we got a little bit spoiled. Honorable mention! Honorable mention, having multiple planets to go to with multiple maps on most of them. I love how each planet feels unique from enemies to environment, I just wish that we had more Athena's maps, and like I said before, you can now travel to any of them at any time from anywhere on any map and it's just so nice to be able to just jump from planet to planet like that number one. coming in at number one quality of life improvements from the movement changes including mantling and sliding to the vastly improved gunplay being able to fast travel from anywhere being able to inspect your weapon parts seeing elevation on a 3d map buying all ammo at once on a vendor auto iridium ammo and money pickup npcs being able to revive you being able to co 
co-op with anyone regardless of their level because the game scales to each player's individual level loot instancing so no more ninja looting the echo cast extension so you can earn loot while watching borderlands streams being able to see the streamers equipped gear with that same extension alternate firing modes on weapons multiple action skill abilities for each vault hunter that you can change anywhere on the fly and many other additional changes that i don't even i can't even remember them all gearbox saw what was being done on borderlands 2 with the pc community patch and implemented almost every single one of those changes and then some the massive amount of quality of life and gameplay improvements make borderlands 3 my absolute favorite borderlands game to date now i understand that not everybody shares my love of borderlands 3 so here are 10 things that i think went wrong with borderlands 3 number 10 at number 10 rushing to get the game out before the holidays now i don't know the specifics of the development process and the publishing process and you know who said to do what when and all that stuff but it did seem very clear from launch of borderlands 3 that it wasn't quite ready for the masses it just needed a little more time in the oven it seemed like there were bugs and crashes frame rate issues and other problems right away now to their credit gearbox worked tirelessly and continually to fix those issues and if we've learned anything in the past few years of watching game development is that launching a big game is challenging and sometimes things just don't quite work out. We're looking at you, Cyberpunk. Over the course of the past two years, Gearbox has done a lot to fix issues, but I would honestly rather wait longer and have a less buggy and problematic launch of future titles. Number nine. And number nine is one that didn't really bother me that much, but I understand why it bothered some of you guys. Epic exclusivity. This was the thing that dominated the early months of Borderlands 3. One month after announcing the game, they announced that it would be an epic exclusive for the first six months, a deal that was reportedly worth over $100 million to publisher 2K. This deal left a bad taste in many fans' mouths, however, since they had previous games on Steam, largely considered the best PC launcher in store, having to wait six months to have the new game in that same library as their other games was a source of contention. Some people were also concerned about potential spyware in the Epic Games launcher, which was completely disproven and, and honestly it was just a crazy conspiracy theory. But Epic Games had promised via their roadmap that achievements and other features would be added, and as of the time of this writing, they still have a lot of undelivered promises. I'm not a fan of exclusivity myself, but I just launched my game from the desktop, so I never really see a launcher unless I'm deleting a game or running an update, so most of the time I don't even know what launcher I'm launching from that said i don't like exclusivity but you know sometimes developers take deals so that you know they can spend more money on their employees and i can't fault them for that number eight and number eight the level cap increases in february of 2020 five months after launch borderlands 3 got its first level cap increase and it was only three levels now previous borderlands games often did as much as 10 levels or more and i think the logic for the smaller level cap increases was not to ruin your existing gear but they kind of underestimated just how much Borderlands players hate underleveled gear, even if it still works, even if it's only a few levels, they hate it. We hate it. At least the level cap increases were free this time around. But you'd think that they would hear these complaints about the low level cap increase and make the next one more substantial, right? Well, with the launch of Guns, Love, and Tentacles, they increased it by four more levels, making it 57 as the max. Three months later, they increased it by three levels again. Three months after that, five more levels. Finally, nine months after level 65, they increased it to level 72 and declared that was it. Again, I'm glad that the level cap increases were free. In Borderlands 2, we actually got charged for every single level cap increase, but five level cap increases are just too many. Should have just done level 60 and then level 72. That's really all we needed in this game. Number seven. At number seven, anointments. This is one of those things that an overwhelming majority of players seem to agree about. There's far too many of them, and early on, most of us farmed for anointments more than we actually farmed for the items that they were attached to. The crazy Earl anointment reroll machine helps a lot with that but reroll costs are way too high there's still far too many annoyments and too many extremely strong annoyments honestly just making annoyments that do a flat 50 percent damage buff for all characters or fire rate and reload speed or movement speed any of those kind of things would be better than the annoyments that we've got right now having individual annoyments for each individual action skill for each character is already too many and having some give 300 percent damage buff while others do as little as 40 percent makes absolutely no sense. You could literally cut half of the annoyments in this game right now, and most people wouldn't even notice. Number six. 
Coming in number six, Mayhem 2.0. In April of 2020, Gearbox announced an overhaul to the flawed and much maligned Mayhem system that they were calling Mayhem 2.0. This new system introduced some of the most annoying disruptive mechanics in Borderlands history, some of which nearly caused even me to quit the game. Luckily, they did eventually introduce Mayhem 11, which gives all the benefit of Mayhem 10, but without the modifiers. However, those six plus months of dealing with Mayhem modifiers were some of the worst Borderlands experiences that I've ever had in my life. A lot of people have also complained about lack of progression through Mayhem levels, similar to what we have with OP levels in Borderlands 2. Now, I would argue that the Mayhem system is better because you can take it slow and choose a Mayhem level that you prefer, or you can go straight to Mayhem 11 and remove those modifiers. But the fact that you can set your game on the highest Mayhem and farm vending machines or tip Moxie does take a little bit of the challenge out of it. And number five, nerfs. Now, even though I'm saying that nerfing items was a mistake, I believe it was somewhat necessary at the time. Now, hear me out. The very first hotfix for Borderlands 3 was a week after launch. They reduced the Torque sticky damage and removed the guaranteed loot tink spawn in Jacob's estate. A week after that, they reduced the damage of the porcelain pipe bomb. If you guys played when the porcelain pipe bomb was the tits, holy cow, that thing just instantly gibbed Graveward into oblivion. A week after that, they nerfed Jacob's and Torque pistols and made Flack a little bit weaker with their action skill. A week later, they made changes to Moe's and her ability to do infinite grenades. All of these changes, whether we like them or not, were done with the intention of making the game more balanced and diverse, and ultimately that's what we got. But a month straight of nerfs at launch felt very restrictive and painful for players, whether it's fair or not. Borderlands 2 also did the exact same thing, by the way. However, it took Borderlands 2 like three months before they got all of the things that were wrong with that game starting to sort out like the evil smasher glitch and stuff like that so it was just a much faster process in borderlands 3 which probably made it feel a little more painful number four at number four, Pearlescent Rarity. Borderlands 1 introduced us to raid bosses and pearlescence. Borderlands 2 took raid bosses to the next level, but did fail to deliver quality pearlescence, mostly due to the imbalanced nature of ultimate mode and OP levels. But Borderlands 3 seemed to just forget both of those things entirely. Don't get me wrong, I love the takedown raid bosses. Yes, even the Guardian takedown raid bosses. Anathema is actually my favorite boss in Borderlands 3, believe it or not. But why did Gearbox abandon pearlescent loot? The takedowns would have been the ultimate place to get those. And of course, introducing raid bosses in each DLC and then having them drop pearls. I just, I just honestly don't understand why a more complicated to acquire rarity was completely abandoned for Borderlands 3. One of the best things about Borderlands games is chasing loot. And whether you feel like having something that's just a different color item than the others is enough of a chase or not, it is really hard to argue with that feeling that you always got when you would see a pearlescent drop in Borderlands 2 or even in Borderlands 1 and just removing that concept entirely makes absolutely no sense at all to me. Number three. And number three, the villains and the story. The Calypso twins, in my opinion, were a very cool concept, but the ultimate judge of a villain is how threatening and how memorable they were. And I felt that the vocal performance of Tyrene was extremely well done, but she never felt like a threat. The only time that the twins did something that actually concerned the players was when they turned Maya into a pile of dust. Even the final fight with Tyrene felt like it could have been more epic. I love the mechanics of the fight, but it just felt so much smaller than the warrior fight from Borderlands 2. I've always just felt like the twins never came close to the standard set by Handsome Jack. And that was one of the things that I said before Borderlands 3 came out is that if we didn't get a villain that was comparable to Handsome Jack, someone that you love to hate, I felt like the story was just going to fail. Living in the shadow of Handsome Jack is a tough sell for any villain. Yes, I know he's dead, but anybody that played Tales from the Borderlands knows that that is a really tentative quote unquote dead. When I saw the early trailers and I noticed Reese from Tales was in this game, I thought, yes, we have a chance at some more Handsome Jack. And if you don't know why I thought that, then go play Tales from the Borderlands. It's absolutely worth it. Not only did we not get more Handsome Jack in any capacity other than in DLC 1, we also got a step down in villains. Do I think that Borderlands needs Handsome Jack as a villain to succeed? No, but I do think that it needs villains that you love to hate. Even small part villains like Private Beans and Captain Trump were generally more interesting to me than the twins as villains. Handsome Jack is a hard villain to follow up. That is true, and I don't envy writers for having to try and take up that task but Borderlands needs a villain like Jack. Somebody who we love to listen to even as they berate us because it was funny as hell. Number two. 
Number two, poor, poor Ava. Written exactly like a teenage girl, full of angst. And yes, I have four teenage nieces, so I feel like I am qualified on this matter. Ava was hated immediately in the Borderlands fandom. Her whining attitude and yelling at Lilith, ignoring orders from Maya, then rushing recklessly at the Calypso twins. But lost in all of this is that Ava has an interesting backstory. She was orphaned at an early age and left to fend for herself, living in a fart cave, as Private Beans pointed out. It's easy to see why she is the way she is. The Ava murder mystery from DLC 6. The director's cut go a long way to help smooth things over with her. Even the cut funeral scene is something that, honestly, I, I I just don't know why they don't just make that and throw it in the game at this point. I know it costs money, but damn, it, it saves the story. But regardless of all that, the damage was already done. A lot of fans just see her as a whiny brat and undeserving of her siren powers and leadership role that Lilith leaves her with. I personally can see her growth a little bit in the, the story, even just the base game, especially in scenes where she's the only person crying for Typhon's death and then when she saves both Tannis and Lilith from certain death at the hands of Tyrene. But I also understand what it is that players dislike about her. To me, she feels a lot like Luke Skywalker in episode four. She's whiny. Sometimes you just want to just, ah, you know, you want to death choke her like Darth Vader, but you can see the potential in growth. She just needs some serious work to smooth her over with most fans. Dishonorable mention. My dishonorable mention goes to screen pollution. Some of the visual effects in this game are breathtaking and downright amazing, but but others, like a screen filled with visual effects, particles, and so forth, is just frustrating. It's so bad at times that I just give up on trying to see what I'm shooting at, and I look at the minimap and point myself toward red dots and hope for the best. It's pretty bad. We need a visual slider in future installments where we can reduce that visual pollution. Number one. Finally, at number one, and this is probably no surprise to anybody that's played Borderlands 3, the thing that everybody spammed me with when I asked is lack of in-game content at launch and beyond. One of the chief complaints that I myself have had since launch is lack of in-game content in Borderlands 3. Now, that said, we do have six proven grounds, three slaughter maps, two takedowns, each with two sets of raid bosses in them, and we also have challenging fights scattered throughout the game like Sponge Boss and Psycho Reaver in DLC 4, the Seer, Hemovorus, and Vermivorous in DLC DLC 6. But one thing that Borderlands has always done since Borderlands 1 is introduce raid bosses. Borderlands 2 obviously did this the best with a multitude of raids, including introducing multiple per DLC that they added and including two with the base game. We even got a bonus raid boss nearly seven years later with the Commander Lilith DLC. But for some reason, Borderlands 3 did not introduce raid bosses with each DLC, did not launch with one. And to me, that was a major, major blow for this game. Fans of Borderlands want a challenge. We want content to keep us grinding. We want to have a use for all this amazing gear that we go and farm and work hard to get and not having raid bosses to use that stuff on, to team up with other people to take down. That was a huge mistake for Borderlands 3. Raid bosses are a major part of the Borderlands franchise and the lack of them in Borderlands 3 is absolutely heartbreaking to me because I love this game and this game could have done raid bosses so much better than any the other games ever have i just feel like it got lost i don't know let me know what you guys think in the comments below i hope you guys enjoyed this video if you did then please drop a like on this video and take a second to hit the subscribe button for more videos like this thank you guys for watching take care